And our first speaker is Julie Erringer. So she was a postdoc in cell biology from 1991 to 1996. And now she is the director of the Gurdon Institute here in town. And her lab studies how gene expression and genome architecture is controlled for development. Pleasure to be here and see so many friends and colleagues from the past. Um, so um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about first about my time in uh, here at the LMB and some influences, and then at the end, a project that I'm really excited about that we're doing. So a little bit of science at the end. So I did my PhD with Judith Kimball, who was a postdoc here, and um, I decided for my postdoc I wanted to come to Worm Mecca, which was the LMB, and I wrote to John White, who agreed to take me on. And it was a great um, grouping environment. John basically just let people get on with whatever they wanted to do. There were three postdocs <clears throat> and a PhD student. And actually after a year and a half, John moved from where I was in Madison and he moved to Madison and we had the lab to ourselves for the last three years of my postdoc. And it was really, the, the cell biology really um, supported us to have our own lab and we published without John by and large. So that was where I started. This is what cell biology looked like when I arrived. Um, I think it's there isn't a lot of diversity here, um, <laughs> but I, it's really great to see it's really it completely changed if you look at cell biology uh, now. So when I arrived John, on my first day, John wasn't there and he left me this note on my bench. I still have. And here you can see it says, well, hello, welcome to the MRC. I'm sorry that I'm not around to greet you, but I am away until Thursday on a busman's holiday in Italy. At least I won't see the shock and horror on your face when you see the condition in, in which you have to work. But take heart, Horvitz, Chalfie, Kenyon, Priest, and Hedgecock all started their worm careers in this miserable room. <laughs> And then um, it wasn't so miserable as he made out and it was perfectly adequate. And it was the worm group was a really nice community and was really supportive. <clears throat> so what I did, I'm not gonna tell you very much, but basically to take, we took advantage of new technology that I thought this was fun that John had invented 4D video micro video recording, which no one had done is very common now, of course taking multiple focal planes through time. And we had this huge video recording system and these discs that were like this big, 300 pounds each then. So it was really expensive. Anyway, I did uh, was studying early embryogenesis and C. elegans got mutants and you could follow the defects in, in time and in live microscopy and this was really powerful. And um, the thing that uh, we, I did var looked at various mutants. And one of the things was looking at receptor finding receptor independent G protein mechanism for spindle positioning. And my lab then start, studied spindle positioning and cell polarity when I started. And like uh, some others, I moved um, <clears throat> onto a fellowship and was supported by Welcome Fellowships for, for quite a long time. And I moved to the University of, of Cambridge in the genetics department and then the Gurdon Institute. And I also wanted to find a job in Cambridge because also I'd met my husband here partially through John White, that's Richard Durbin, who had done his um, PhD with John and had come back as a as a group leader. So I was keen to find a job here and I fortunately found one. <laughs> so part of meeting Richard and talking to John and talking to also John Salston is we had worm group meetings. In addition, we had the Wednesday me meetings in cell biology. We had Friday afternoon worm group meetings. And afterwards, we'd always go to the Frank Lee. I don't know if people go to the Frank Lee anymore. Um, and these were really fun and also really influential. And this had this is probably the thing that made the biggest difference for um, in, in having an influence. We had really rambling discussions, often led by John Sulston, about what what is a worthwhile scientific goal and how might you achieve it? What kind of big problem could there be and they were thinking, they were just when I arrived, sequencing the first worm, the cosmid to sequence the worm genome. And John was really, I think, inspiring. He did really took on big projects and he, he had such a big scientific impact in finding the, doing the C. elegans lineage, the C. elegans genomic sequence, leading that with Bob Waterston, co-leading the human genome, 
making data freely accessible and just a series of, of things. And so these discussions and thinking about, can you do a big project and not being scared? I think that was um, John Sulston really influenced me there. So not long after I started my lab, um, two, th these two pivotal things happened all, simul at the same year in 1998. Is the first, the complete CLEN's genome sequence was, was available. So then that, as I said, was with John Sulston, Bob Waterston, and then we had the DNA sequence of every gene. And the discovery of RNA interference, which is a really rapid way by Andy Fire and Craig Mello, and Andy Fire was also a postdoc at the LMB before my time. This was a way to rapidly, as you probably are aware, inhibit gene function through double-stranded RNA in a sequence-dependent fashion. So if you put these things together, you could think, well, you can take do RNAi of every gene, but this seemed, um, you know, so in theory, you could do this. And we thought, well, could we actually make an, an RNAi clone? Could we, if you can make a bacteria that will make the double-stranded RNA with a plasmid, feed it to the worms, and that would knock down the gene function. So if you had a plasma, a library of all the bacterial strains, one of every, for every gene, you could knock out all the genes. And so we thought, well, let's, yeah, maybe we can do it. We'll take it on. And I think part of that was being here and being inspired to really think, if you have a big problem, think of a way to do it and, and do it. So we basically developed this genome-wide RNAi screening for the worm and made the library now 20,000 bacterial strains where you can test the function of each gene one by one. And it's very rapid. And this is used by thousands of researchers. It's a staple. And it's, that's been really rewarding. And we've used it extensively in our research to study and identify genes um, involved in diverse processes from um, cell polarity and asymmetric cell division and laterally in chromatin regulation. So um, skipping forward now, um, I want to tell you about um, my, my lab studied um, early cell, cell biological processes for about 10 or 12 years. We had also working on chromatin and, and understanding um, how the DNA, uh, how genome is regulated. And eventually I decided to pivot and close down the cell biology work and really focus on understanding how, how the genome is regulated. And um, clearly, and we had to spend a long time characterizing C. elegans genome. And I'm not gonna tell you much about that, except we did a lot of work trying to, to, to map and understand regulatory elements like enhancers and promoters. We need to know, if you wanna know how the genome is functioning and how, do, how is it regulated, you need to know where these key elements are and looking a lot at chromatin and finding out where proteins are localized. But really to understand this process, we were studying static um, time points and whole animals or sorted tissues, which were still mixed. We really, you really wanna, do this at the level of single cells if you want to really follow these processes and understand it. So um, a game changer is the this development of single cell sequencing. And um, I just want to go through, um, of course, under, in all animal development, it starts with a, zygote, a, a single cell zygote that's quiescent. And then um, the zygotic genome is activated at some point. You have this um, re time of lineage specification where the cells become different and go down different paths and progressively they make decisions and eventually you have organic gen genesis and differentiation. So um, really what we want to do is understand all these decision points from one cell to one cell division to the next and applying single cell profiling in animals, you can take groups of embryos separate them, and now we can do, we can assay, for example, gene expression at the level of individual cells, and then, and try and then put all the cells back together computationally in some order, people call pseudo time order. But essentially what you really want to know is the cell to cell transitions. As you go from one, a mother cell, comparing the mother cell to the daughter cell, the gene expression and the regulatory elements and the whole conformation of the genome, step by step, and then if you could actually do that, you would be able to go quite a ways to understand development and how the genome directs development. So one problem is um, single cell profiling is destructive. So if you profile a cell, you don't know what its daughters are gonna be, but 
the worm, because of the worm development, that solves this problem. And as, one, as I told you, John Sulston worked out this whole cell lineage of the C. elegans uh, zygote, uh, so of the C. elegans embryogenesis in 1983. So it's every single time it has the same pattern of cell division, the, the cells are in the same position. So if you do single cell profiling in the worm embryo and you do it of different cells, essentially here, if we have the early lineage, and this is where we're starting out this work, we can take, um, what we do is that we isolate nuclei because then we can assess ongoing transcription in, in, in the single nucleus that's happening at that time, not the steady state of the whole but in the cytoplasm. And then we can also assay the conformation of the genome using um, looking at chromatin accessibility. We isolate these nuclei, and then we do the single cell profile of uh, using this 10x genomics multiome. So we can assay the RNA in the nucleus and the genome function. And then we can um, map those cells onto the lineage tree. So if we have all different embryos, then we can compare the mother cell gene expression and genome conformation to the daughter cells as we march through the, gene, the whole lineage. So this is the, what we're trying to do now. Um, and so here's a what's called a UMAP, which is all, all of each dot is a single cell, and you can cluster them based on similar profiles of uh, gene expression and, and also chromatin accessibility. And we've been able to now identify single cells in this early lineage tree here some of them labeled. And now we can then look as a proof of principle, can we actually follow a, a developmental process and how well does this work? So I'm just gonna show you, um, this is the early lineage of the, of the endoderm. So here's the E blastomere, it's the eight cell stage. It makes 20 cells, it makes the whole worm intestine. So here's the mother of the E cell, which is called EMS. And that divides to give E and MS. And we're going to follow EMS to E to the two E daughters and then to the four E daughters. And Jim McGee's lab had discovered, has worked from him and other people, had shown there's a cascade of GATA factors that are expressed at different times across these early cell divisions here. So we wanted to, as a proof of principle, could we visualize this? And this just worked better than we had expected. So here's our EMS cell, and we can see those first genes that we know should be in uh, EMS. Those MED genes are here. This is RNA, and none of the other factors are present. And now when we find our E cells in there, we can see here's the chromatin is accessible, and we see the next genes, these two should be on, and we see the chromatin is opening a cell division earlier. This is going to, to be on in the next cell division. And there now we can see the RNA in red and the chromosome open and then the next cell division. So as we watch six step by step, we can actually see the genome opening here, closing again. And th so this is really working. This is really exciting for us. And um, just a little tidbit of something that we've learned is looking at um, um, now wondering about how the, the zygotic genome is activated and what's happening in this, this early, very interesting phase of development. We looked at, can we find genes that are expressed in these very early cells compared to all the rest of the map or later cells in, in the lineage? And we found 126 genes here. And these are just two examples that had this expression pattern, which they're expressed in this part in all of these cells and not really not as highly in the rest of the of the of the cells and these are um here's these uh, the types of genes here are the whole scf ubiquitin ligase complex many rna binding proteins like the ccc h finger protein um many genes involved in rna metabolism transcription factors like this fork head transcription factor and several repetitive elements as well and so we think this is a program of maternal to, to embryo transition, to converting the zygote into, it, to, um, into that's under the maternal control. So it's under the zygotic control where it has to clear maternal proteins and do uh, remodel the, um, the chromatin. And now that we have these candidates, we have transcription factors and we can see the motifs, uh, the regulatory elements in front of these. We're starting to build a pathway from the zygote in, into the early um, development and lineage specification. 
So, um, so what we really want to do is the whole lineage. I've just shown you this really top bit there, and that's our first goal. But we would like to do this to monitor, to look at all the mother to daughter cell transitions in the whole lineage to try and understand these all these different decisions and all the how there might be different types of mechanisms in in, in the di different decisions. And we're going to in include different data types, for example, single cell histone modifications and other types of data to to get a to start to get a picture of how from a naive genome it changes and you have different activity states as you get all the way through to, to making this lovely worm uh, at the end. And so these are just uh, people who are involved in this project now. And I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you very much. This is really exciting. Um, I found quite striking the temporal progression of the data, the data factors that you showed. Um, did you also find some direct links between them? So can you find, for instance, if you cheat one of these factors, can you find it uh, activating the second one? Or is it going through other loops? So these, these probably are direct. And from Jim McGee's lab has done also analyze it for motor. But we can also see those GATA sites and actually now that we have more information and we looking um, and we have more target, we can see they have different sorts of GATA. Those GATA factors have very slightly different motifs. So having the genome wide data has been really powerful. And we actually have candidate now for the lineage for all the different diversification. It's very interesting. You see these bifurcations in the lineage. We then see when it divide when it bifurcates, we see two different transcription factors often at each kind of, um, and we can see then targets of those by looking for the most. And, and do you perhaps see the same transcription factor having different roles depending on the chromatin context? So downstream in the tree, do you, do you always switch to a different one or does it change? So that it actually, we see it's almost always combinations of transcription factors. And we're just really starting to, at the beginning stage because it turns out the, the single cell profiling it's really powerful and exciting, but it's actually the data collection is way ahead of the computational, what we can do computationally. And so now we're, we're linking together with experts in computational genomics and, and artificial intelligence to try and, because it's this huge dynamic data set, even the, this little part of the lineage that we're looking at has 300 cell types. If you look at all of the different intermediates, because at the end it's 559, but in the whole lineage it's, it's several thousand. Okay. So I was curious as to how well pseudo time compares with what you've been able to do here. Well, we, um, I'm sure that this is better. <laughs> we can also, we can, we can validate, you know, in an individual, we have marker genes, so we're doing RNA fish, so we know our, our annotations are correct. But actually, I think People find that the pseudo time works pretty well, but they have they know that it's the people who can't that they don't have a lineage. So one of the things that we want to do is develop with these these computational colleagues is new methods for doing um, the lineage instead of pseudo time add, adds other information, and then we can do, develop it in the worm where we know the ground truth. And that's part of the problem is no one has a ground truth, so they think. It kind of makes sense, but you can't tell if it's true or not because you don't know what the truth is. So we're developing it on the worm, and hopefully these methods will then apply a lot more widely. Thank you very much.